L'année dernière, Nordin Melikeshi a fait vibrer la salle. Euh, hélas, nous n'avons pas eu beaucoup de temps de, à, à échanger avec euh, Nordin, mais cette année, j'espère qu'on aura le temps d'échanger avec lui. Euh, pour ceux qui ne le connaissent pas, qui est Nordin Donc, Dr. Nordin Melikeshi, l'ambassadeur de la planète Mars à Delaware, professeur de physique, directeur fondateur du Centre des sciences optiques pour la recherche appliquée, et le doyen de la faculté mathématiques, sciences naturelles et la technologie à l'Université de l'État de Delaware. Docteur Melikashi a obtenu son baccalauréat en mathématiques en Algérie, un diplôme d'études supérieures en physique de l'Université des sciences et technologies à Huaribou Medien, à Alger, un master, vous pouvez applaudir, hein, c'est Bab Zouar. <rires> Un master, au, un master et un doctorat en philosophie, un doctorat de philosophie en physique de l'université, de l'université de Sussex en Angleterre. Il a été nommé dans de nombreux, nombreux boards et comités. Récemment, il a été nommé au conseil scientifique du Centre pour le développement de technologies de pointe aux US. Dr. Melikashi a également plus de 120 publications et 15 brevets. Il est également le récipiendaire de nombreux prix, le dernier, de 2013, Arfkin Physics Scholar in the Residence, Miami University. Il va en parler tout à l'heure. Donc, euh, je vous demande d'applaudir Dr. Malikashi. Est-ce que je parlerai de... Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Bonjour, salam alaikum, azlifullahouen. C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Je suis vraiment, vraiment content. Et avant de commencer, j'aimerais que tout le monde applaudisse Marhon et, ah, merci, et, et merci. tous ceux qui les ont aidés pour le parfait travail qu'on a fait aujourd'hui. Alors, c'est un plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Je commence mon, 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 mon speech ici en français, mais je passe directement à l'anglais pour des raisons que, comme la dernière fois, je n'ai pas expliqué. C'est mon droit, donc je vais le faire. Donc voilà. Donc aujourd'hui, je vais vous, pas, je vais vous parler... De, euh, du travail que je fais, et, de, et, et en fait, euh, je passe directement à l'anglais tout de suite. Donc, je vais parler de lutter contre le cancer sur la Terre, et aussi de chercher pour la vie sur Mars, sur la planète Mars. Et je vais parler, c'est une journée qui m'a conduit de mon pays, pas loin de ici, à 300 millions de kilomètres de so, That's a really long journey. As Marhon said, you know, my name is there. I have to give, I have these titles, so by contract almost I have to say them. So I'm the African scholar. I'm a visiting professor at Vassar College in New York, and I'm also the dean at Delaware State University. Having said that, let's get back to where we were a year ago, 14 months ago. 14 months ago, I think I've convinced you that everybody, I hope, everybody had to have a dream, and the first step to progress was a dream, was having a dream. Because if you don't have a dream, you're going to work for somebody else's dream. So you might have your own dream and work on it. Today, I hope to convince you that for that dream to get to take place and to happen, it's not going to happen by itself. You need to have the proper, the, the, a, a proper mindset. Work hard, but that also is a proper mindset. And the proper ma- mindset will allow you to actually make your dream a reality. If you want to prepare your future, what I call the preferred future, past is past, Pre- future is ours. We have to invent it. So we need to know what is our preferred future and then work so that it happens. So to have your preferred future take place, you need a preferred mindset. And we're going to talk about that. And then the question is, of course, is that mindset something that depends on our genes? The answer is no. Is it, you know, is it, is it on the environment? And probably the answer is yes. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then I will share, these are thoughts. And I, I really do not like to talk about myself, but this is my journey as an example, as my good brother over there, but you guys said yesterday, if I did it, you can do it, and you can do better than this too. There will be a flight to Venus, I hope you'll be part of it, some of you. So, 
So what I want to talk about, the preferred mindset, is really optimism. But I like to put that word in front of it. Active optimism. It's not just optimist and wait, but optimism where actually do things so that things will change. And that's what I'm going to talk about. The word optimism, when Marhun and Tufik called me and we talked, I want to look into this word. Where does it come from? Well, the word optimism actually was first used in 1737, for the first time, at least recorded literature. And then it was used in English in 1759. And then it was adopted by the French Academy in 1762. But the state, okay, so, but the, 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 the mindset of being optimistic clearly preceded that. Just the word started in 1757. So, how did it come about? Well, it came about because a mathematician by the name of Leibniz looked into something called, into some functions, and trying to find maxima and minima, and what he called the optimum. From there came optimism. So how do you, from a set of infinite, infinite possibilities, how do you choose that mindset that will allow you to be having your optimum, your best possibilities for you to do what you want to do, and in this case, prepare your future so you have your preferred future. Not mine, not anybody else's, but your preferred future, whatever that might be. So, so Leibniz, as I said, was the first one to do that. And as I will see, optimism is not something that is just, it's not a quantum state, just exists in, 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 just by itself. It is something that depends on the environment, and we're going to talk about that in a minute too. Now, who has heard of this guy? Abbas ibn Firdaus. He is a, he's from this area, he's, he's a Mazir from here, from, from, uh, from Algeria, from, from North Africa, sorry. And he is known to be the man who jumped from off the earth. That's him. And he is actually the first human to actually fly. And he did this in Cordoba, not far from here. Remember, we have a lab 300 million kilometers away, so Cordoba and Algiers are single point at this point. And this guy, his, his work was redone. The same design, or similar designs, was redone by Leonardo da Vinci. But of course, history remembers a lot more Leonardo da Vinci than Abbas ibn Furness. And he did it because he had a dream, and he flew in Cordoba for a few minutes and landed. He had some injuries, but he was fine. He designed something that was absolutely stunning and that, that now people are starting to look at. He also, by the way, he was the first one, I heard a talk the other day about you know, crystal, crystals and so forth. He was the first one to, to, to actually work on glass, few silica glass. So, now, my work, as I said, is, combines two things, but one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about is cancer. I'm going to tell you why cancer. Well, cancer for some, why am I working on cancer? And I'm working on cancer because, number one, it's a very old disease. There's evidence that some of the mummies in Egypt died of cancer. So it's not a new disease. So it, it hits all of us. This is a picture, and I won't keep it there because I really can't even look at it myself. This is a Lebanese girl who's 15 years old, and this is her cancer. She had about 83 lesions on her brain, on, on her head, sorry, outside lesions. And she was treated by photo photodynamic therapy. And I've seen this in Venezuela, on a visit to Venezuela, on the new technology for cancer they were looking at. And she, she, she was fine, from what I understand, uh, a few months later. Of course, the human cost for, for cancer. I also like to show this because it's shocking a little bit. This is how people used to treat cancer in the 15th, 16th century. For those of you who know people who have breast cancer, it hasn't changed that much. It's still breast ablation. Yeah, you've got anesthesia, you've got these things, but it hasn't changed that much. And so it is actually, it, acts, it, it hits a lot of us. In fact, one woman, one woman in eight will have breast cancer in her life. One man in six will have prostate cancer in, in his life. So that's a huge, a huge number. So now, let me put this in perspective for you. I know we like soccer in this country, and I do too. This is a scene of people watching a soccer game. Those numbers mean the following. If I divide 
this group into 12, that means that group, it's one of every two men and one of every woman has a probability of suffering from cancer in his or her life. So that means in that stadium I just showed you, that group will suffer from cancer. That group will suffer from cancer. That group will suffer from cancer. cancer. That group will have cancer. That group will have cancer. And that group, so that's a lot of groups, sorry. That's a lot of groups, one, two, three, four, five. So that stadium, those people in those stadium, actually a lot of them are going to suffer from cancer. This is statistics. This is not something that just, it's, it, it's probability, probability of developing cancer, all sites, not breast or prostate, all cancers. And that, and that is the reason in 2008, 7.6 million people worldwide has di have died from cancer. 7.6 million people have died from cancer. That's a lot of people. So, so what do we do? Well, let me just explain very, very fast what cancer is. Cancer is that these cells that we have that divide in our, in our bodies divide, but they divide in a way that's not coherent. They start to actually divide a little bit incoherently with no, no organization. But also, it depends on the genetic factors and the environment. Do you have tobacco? Do you, do, do you take drugs? And do you have a healthy lifestyle and so forth? All of those two combines give cancer. But of course, we cannot look at every cell because we have, we have um, 310 to the 14 cells. So it's, it's, it's 300 trillion cells in our body. And there are about 210 to the 12, so a few trillion cell divisions every minute in our body, or every 24 hours, sorry. So, so those divisions, we can't, we can't, at the moment, we can't look at them. So we have still to find something on what to do. So what's the problem? The problem is this. I'm going to try to put it very simply. The problem is that if I ask you to differentiate between those two colors, can you differentiate that? The answer is yes. Our bodies, with our eyes, smells, everything else, we can do that. But if I ask you now to differentiate between those blood cells, those, th that blood samples in there, six of them, they all look the same. But one of them in there has cancer. And it's much, much difficult to, to compare to actually find with differences. So that's the difficulty. So, in my group, we decided to try to tackle this. But it's actually even more difficult than that. The current technologies measure biomarkers. If you have prostate cancer, you go to the doctor, here or anywhere else, they're going to measure your PCA. If you have ovarian cancer, they're going to measure something called CA125. Here's the problem with that, is that if you measure those, if you have patient number one, as you can see, you measure it in a time t, so time is, is, time is on the x-axis, you measure it at one time. But some people may have their biomarkers dynamic different than the others. But we don't do it very often because it's too expensive. So we don't really know how those biomarkers really act. And, there's a, and this is evidence, there's a good article which says to the doctors, how confident are you to talk to your patients about your biomarkers? By a doctor called Blast, uh, who is... Uh, uh, famous uh, cancer. In fact, there's also a lot of articles in the press, in the New York Times. There's a very, very good article about all these biomarkers and detection of cancers. So, so the proper mi mindset, the proper mindset when we look at this is we have to do something. And in fact, the problem is so big, and the technologies and the money that's thrown at it is about 200 billion dollars in the U.S. only. That's thrown at this problem is so large. It's huge. Guess what? We need to look at it differently. And I like this because I read what people, you know, people who've been famous and done the good things, what they do. I like this quote by St. Gordon, who got the Nobel Prize in, a few years ago. He says, discovery consists in seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. That's what discovery is. You see the same data today, you, you can see to anything you want. But can you think differently than the others? And to talk about pessimism and, and optimism, Winston Churchill said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an opportunist sees the opportunity in every, every difficulty. That's the difference. So when you look at those difficulties, we have to come up with something new. The other problem, this is actually a slide give, uh, that we worked with with Dr. Sh uh, Nemiroff, who's at the University of Miami. He's the chair of psychiatry department there. We spent a few days working together on, on some of the things. And what you can see here is that actually we have a tendency to go to the doctor 
once we are sick, once we have clinical things, once our body tells us, I'm not feeling so well, that is a little bit late. It's what's called the tipping point. It's actually when you are feeling bad. It's already bad. That's true for the economy. That's true for everything. When you pass that tipping point, then it's a little bit, not too late, but it's a little bit sad that you didn't detect it before. But look at that. From birth to death, we can do a lot of work way before. And that's what we're trying to do in my lab in this research. And I will connect this to Mars in a minute, so please stay on your seats. It's not, it's not, it's not finished. So we'll try to do that. This is, this slide here, represents what I and others believe is the 21st century medicine. We need to change the way medicine is done so it becomes more preventive, more accessible to people, and, and, and more accessible meaning cheaper, and also for the masses. So that actually the idea that we have, me and my collaborators, the idea is it's not, it's not, it's not a luxury. We have to. In England, the guy who got Nobel Prize, Rutherford, physicist, said at one point, gentlemen to his group, we have run out of money. It's time to start thinking. That's what I'm saying. We are going to run out of money to solve this problem and Alzheimer's and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and all of this. So we need to start thinking, thinking on how to change medicine. I might not change it, but I hope somebody in this room will. Because you, the young, can do it if you keep thinking outside of the box. So the general idea is act before the tipping point. Act before things go down. Act before it's too late. Act early. So, but how? In my group, we wanted to look, about 10 years ago, we wanted to develop a method that is accessible to all. We wanted to take a drop of blood, a single drop of blood, in fact, a nano drop of blood. So, a single drop of blood, or saliva, or urine, or any biomedical fluid, and figure out whether we can detect cancers or not. And the answer is, we think we can. So, and the reason is because nature, I'm a physicist, nature gives us signatures, atomic and molecular signatures. Nature as a whole is open to everybody, and if you ask it the right questions, it gives you answers. You just need to know how to ask. And you know how to ask if you know the fundamental physics and chemistry and mathematics and computer science. So you can ask those questions, so you can get the answers, so you can solve these problems. So, what do we do with this? So we want to also change the practice of medicine. Now, people say this, Nurdin, they tell me, this is high risk. I say yes, but it's also high return. I am no longer interested in pushing the binary of science just a tiny bit. We want to change this, not just me. I have a lot of collaborators to do this, of course, many collaborators. So, so we need science, we need nanochemistry, we need, we need molecular physics, we need mathematics, computer science, and we need to understand translational medicine. How do we go from one research to the bed, to, 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 to hospitals and so forth? This is the example, I'm not going to go through this, but this is what we tell you. For if these results are incredible, we have been able to detect just a single blood, single drop of blood from, from people and from mice. We have been able to detect accurately if people are going to have cancers way before anybody can tell them you have cancers in 63% of the time at one point, 65%, 72%, just before I came to Fikra. Two days before I came to Fikra, we reached 93% accuracy. And that is great. However, however, 93% accuracy means that if I have 100 people who come to, to hospital, we're going to get seven wrong. That's not good enough. So we are trying to reach, we're trying to reach 100%. So the difficulty is huge. I'm not going to talk about it. But the difficulty in what we had to do here, we had, if we had to actually create some nanoparticles with some, with some, uh, with some proteins and get them together. And we get them together is so hard because if they fall and do that thing, so it's like a bump like this. If they fall, it doesn't work. So we had to send them and get them so that they slow down. So like sending or rolling something over a hill, if you send it too fast, it goes above the hill and goes down. We're talking about distances that are a few billionth of a meter. So that's not easy, but we've done it. And that is because we have been able to change the environment of that molecule. 
If you see those bumps, now we know how to change them. So we can design the bump that we want and get the molecules to be there as they wish. Now, how is this connected to Mars? You'll see that in a minute. This is a picture of Mars. Mars about a month ago. And this picture shows you the genius of people, of human beings, not mine, not just the team, of human beings, because so many people who've worked to get to this point. And what I will tell you now, if you see at the top, as I said, there are signatures. The top there is the first signature of any planet with a laser ever taken by a human being. So it's over there at the top. That's the first one ever taken, and it was taken 13 days after we landed. The bottom is the signature of the blood of, some, of, of cancerous and non-cancerous. Do you see similarities? Do you see similarities? The similarities are you have colors on one side and you have peaks. And it's a study of these peaks, it's physics, that's why we can work on both. That is the reason. There are other similarities, I don't have time to go through them, but that is the reason we are, I'm working on Mars, and because the, what, the data that we get looks similar, and the physics is almost similar. It's, almost, it's very, very, well, it is similar. Very similar. That's why I can work on both, and what I can learn from Mars, bring it to cancer. What I can learn from cancer, bring it to Mars. And that's the reason we work on both. <laughs> this is actually the first time, as I said, this is a paper, if anybody's interested, that looks at those. And let me just say this. What we are doing on Mars, we are trying to find whether Mars was habitable or, or is habitable, but not whether there is life or not. And, and habitable means you need to have some elements and water. So, as a friend of mine here from, uh, from my town said uh, to me, uh, we found water on Mars, and we, we know now that there's water on Mars. It's about 2% water on Mars. And he said to me, well, I knew that already. Here it is, Mars bar underneath and Mars on top of it. So it's just, that's the Algerian thing. You don't really have to work on it. We knew it. Um, I'm going to go far from this. This is Curiosity with the 10 instruments on it. This is actually a picture taken on Mars. And um, this is just to show you. This is the difficulty, talking about optimism. I mean, for this, for this mission to work, we had to land in that tiny circle, never done before. It is like sending a penny, if you want, or di uh, a dinar, and dinar, she's exist on I'm in PS with dinar, one piece of dinar from here to, for example, 400 kilometers, let's say Oran. You throw it from here to Oran, and it has to land on a seat not bigger, not on, a, on, on, a, on a point not bigger than, than, than a plate. That is the same thing. So you send it from here to Oran, about one dinar, and it has to land in Oran on one single plate, same plate. And it's actually the environment is even more complex on Earth. And it was done. Talk about optimism. I'm not going to go through how we did this because I see the time. But what I want to share with you is this, these natural signatures are very, very important. And we found, this is actually, we found all the elements that are necessary for life. Not life. But we find all the elements that are necessary for life, and these are the things that show them. This is, for example, maybe this, you, 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 this is easy to understand, I think. If you see this, this on the left-hand side, is a rock on Mars. The other one on, on the right-hand side is, is, is on Earth. What you can see is you've got these veins, these white veins, you can see them. Well, at home, I know my home when we were in Tania, you know, you, when you have water flowing somewhere, if it doesn't work, what happens? You've got this calcium buildup, right? Calcium buildup, calcium buildup. Well, that's calcium buildup. I know it's calcium buildup because we shot at it with a laser. We shot at it with a laser 300 million kilometers away, 70 meters, seven meters away, and it's a narrow and very narrow thin, and it worked, and we got the calcium. Talk about optimism. That looked really impossible to do, but it was done. Now, if, if, if the story I want to tell you is this. I am not, just like Bill Gessman said yesterday, I'm not different than you. If I've done this, you can too. You, can do, not, you don't have to do this, but you can do whatever you want and you can do it successfully if you believe in yourself. That's number one. Let me just tell you a story too, I just put this this morning. Actually, when I was a Bebzuar in my second year, I almost stopped studies. I gave up. The reason was I had to come from, not just me, everybody coming east of Bebzuar, east, Tizuzu, et cetera, et cetera, we had to go to Wetsmar because the train didn't stop in Bebzuar, and then get out, walk through the mud. We always got late because the trains were late. So second year, a lot of people gave up, and my mother and some people just said, don't give up, just keep going. 
and it was extremely, extremely hard to get to the classes in the morning because of the trains. Because the train from Maldives would not stop. It would stop in Bebzuar, but, 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 uh, but we had to go to Wetzmar and back or walk. And in both cases, in many cases, we missed so many classes in the morning. And I want to say this just to tell you the difficulties that we had in getting to those classes in the morning at that time. So now I want to share with you just um, what optimism is for me. For me, optimism, and I said it's active optimism, is that energy that allows you to, to, to fulfill your dream. That's what it is. I know he's going to ask me later, so I gave him the answer right now. <laughs> so, so just think about it. I come from a town where there was no high school. No high school, none. I had to go to, to another high school, another town, and so forth. But now I'm meeting with Steve Chu, that's Nobel Prize winner, Secretary of Energy of Obama. Came to my lab to discuss physics, to talk. So that's the Secretary of Energy. I talked to the director of NASA. That's him over there, the general administration of NASA. Comes to my lab, we discuss things. I, I am, as has been said, I am the ambassador of Mars by the governor and the state senate who gave me this honor. Now I'm telling you this not to brag about myself, to tell you that if you want to do something, you can do it because I am certainly not better than you are. Now, so that's what optimism is for me, is the, is the preferred future and you need that fuel. Now, if we can just play the video now before we go to this, that would be great. You have a video, it's not too long. I know we, we, between you and, and, uh, and lunch, we have about three minutes video. to say next is that this is not the work of a single individual. There are many, many people. And this is true for anything that you do. So I really encourage you to actually look for people who can help you, who can mentor you. I started to work on projects for NASA in 1997, 96, 97. And I had a great mentor, his name is Dr. Six, who was absolutely wonderful. Because trust me, when you go somewhere and somebody asks you, is that is done? Because once it goes to flight, it's finished. There's nothing you can do. It's, it's over. But let me just finish this. Optimism, you can do it. But you don't have to do it by getting all of these 
drugs and try to figure out how much you have to work. So you're driving somewhere in California or Delaware and you have to go with Prozac or anything else. If you have that, you don't need any of those. And the reason is this, because we're here many people think and believe that the grass is always greener on the other side. But the grass is always greener where if you water it, wherever you are. So just water your grass. Before I finish, this is not only my work. So these are actually the team that actually work on ChemCam. This is in my, in, at my university when we just met in December. So all of you guys are there. People from, uh, from Los Alamos, from Caltech, from, from Toulouse, France, from other places. This is uh, Yuri, a Russian guy. I'll just tell you how global it is. Uh, this is Dr. Jen Ran, she is Chinese. Uh, Angela, she's American. Um, from Malaga, from uh, close to Cordoba. Here's the one I keep talking about. Do you hear about it? Uh, Angel. Uh, then, uh, uh, oh, her name escapes me. But uh, Dr. Johnson from, uh, from uh, Fox Chase Cancer Center, she works with us. Dr. Pokrojak, who does a computer science with us. And my student, Alyssa. My student, Leon. My student, Harry. Uh, Siva, my other student and also my student Brian, who actually just got a job at NASA, and we're very happy for him. So this, uh, this presentation, I am dedicating it to all can cancer patients, because I know how hard it is. And thank you, thank you, and thank you, and please thank you for, thank you again, Tofir and Marhon for everything. It's wonderful to be with you. Nordin, you always rock. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, if you guys have questions, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. I see already hands. You are the first one. Before we forget, Nordin has brought us this. It's an autocollant that we can put in the cars. And so it's my friend's other vehicle, Zaps, Rocks and Mars. So the other vehicle of my friend, Zaps, Rocks and Mars. Donc, voilà. euh, Comme ça, vous ramené... êtes tous mes amis, hein, tous mes amis, mes frères et sœurs. Il en a ramené quelques vous. centaines et il va en... nous envoyer d'autres si vous voulez après. Uh, so, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, uh, we thank you, thank you very much for your amazing presentation. We are really proud of you. Uh, my question is uh, simply, what are the keys of success according to you? What make, what make us uh, achieve what you have achieved? And um, do we just need to have a plan, to have a vision, and to have a plan to, to, to achieve our goals and our aims? Thank you. I, I need to stand up. Of course. I think, you know, if you want to, to achieve something, you need to know what you want to achieve. You don't have to achieve, you don't have to go to Mars. You don't have to have the biggest company in the world. But your dream, what is it that makes you happy? What is your preferred future? Then you have a plan. You need to plan. Let me tell you this about the plan. If you're going to build a house, do you need a plan or not? In fact, you're going to pay an architect to do that plan, right? So do you think you need a plan for your life? A house, you have a plan. Your life, you don't have a plan? Which one is more important? So you do need a plan, okay? So the other thing is you have to believe in yourself. You have to work just as hard as anybody else. People who are successful work so hard to do what they want to do. So if you believe in yourself, if you work very hard, if you, if you sort of gather people around you who can mentor you, you have that environment that I talked about that can help you sustain you, then you will be successful. Because you have no other choice. You have to be. Um, Nordin, I have a question. How do you do to work uh, on both cancer research and uh, Mars rover mission? Yeah. The, the, the reason I work on both, because both on Mars, the lab on Mars Curiosity, and on, on cancer, we use lasers. And I'm a laser, 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 laser scientist. We use lasers, so therefore the physics of lasers that we do is extremely important. Now on Mars, we search for life. And on, in cancers in my lab, we search for things that stop life, that kill cells. So it's a little bit different, but it's very similar. Then we have to develop new methods, mathematical methods that we have developed that actually come into both. So they work on both. Um, can you tell me an anecdote? Uh, Bill Gessem, he wants to ask a question. And then you'll tell me about an anecdote you had. Best anecdote okay. in NASA. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, we can't hear you, Bill Gessem. No one can hear you. Uh, 
الو جو كوني غيان سور الكونسير بالقاسم حبا جوست ان بوان نعرف نور الدين جوست جمعت باب زوار لهنا هزو يديكم ان بو سيبورتال باب زوار نعرف باب نعرف نور الدين دوبوي لونتون ونعرفه قبل ما حبيت نقول باللي هي ان كروند بروبيلي تخرج من نيمبورت كيل يونيفرسيتي بلوس كو سا دخلت انا ونور الدين لا ميم اني لا ميم كلاس بوندون كاتر اني Um, so, anecdote from NASA, and then I'll take this. Uh, so, Mr. I, I, I will share this with you, the anecdote. Anecdote so from they, NASA. There are many anecdotes, but I share this with you, something that really surprised me. When we landed on Mars, I had published a paper on the table of elements. You know, table of elements. So, all the chemical elements, the hundred and so. So, I got this phone call from somebody who had read a lot of papers that I had written. And he said that he wanted to talk to me because he's seen this. And so I said, okay, well, he sounded like he was a scientist, he wanted truly to be interested, and he knew a little bit what he was talking about. When he called me back, we had to we set up a time, then I realized there's something really fishy going here. He told me that we knew, and I knew, and some other people knew, that we had 300 elements. That's why we're going to Mars. There are only 100, by the way. That we had 300, and we didn't want to make it public. And that, um, you know, he was going to sue and all that stuff. Number two that I was in charge of interviewing kids who have an IQ of close to 180 so they can go to Mars. And that I already had the list. And that was my job. So then I knew this guy was not exactly right. He needed to go and see Dr. Demeroff in, in psychiatry department. In fact, I, I did propose that to him, but he became really angry. Then I got a phone call when he said, him and his friends are going to come and see me. And he called. And I said, you know what? You don't have to come and see me, but if you do want to come and see me, I'm going to Algeria. So come with me to Algeria, and we will meet you there. So <laughs> he never came. Question, please, Joe. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Bonjour. Donc uh, j'ai deux questions. Uh, on, vous te, on vous entend mal. Mm -hmm. Donc uh, j'ai deux questions. Uh, une demande, s'il vous plaît. Donc uh, the, the first question is: uh, Can you tell us how your data from Mars helped you? Uh, in uh, your project with uh, concerning cancer, uh, just, uh, can you um, uh, tell us an example of that? My second question is: um, As a computer science student, how uh, how did computer science help you in your work? And uh, my demand is: uh, What is your uh, the most uh, beautiful moment in physics or in science in general that you had in your life? Thank you. So, good questions. I think if you are computer science students, and I'm going to say this, not just for Mars, you've heard all the presentations. What do you think is coming to us? What do you think is coming to human beings? A lot of data. You heard the speaker before me, temperature, humidity, your weight. But a lot of data. It's the era of big data. Now, somebody has to analyze that data. So, big data, analysis of that big data is going to be critical. Same thing on Mars. Second thing, classification, statistics. How do we do? Now, if I, didn't, I don't have time, to, and I'll be happy to talk to you later on, but the, one of the things you've seen Armus's video, we look class by class. A class is a small pebble. Class by class, point by point on Mars. So every shot of a laser, that's five billionths of a second, is gets analyzed. Same thing on cancer. It's with a laser, and every single flash of light is analyzed the same way. And therefore, the mathematical the, mathem the mathematics and computer science that's needed is between the two. There's, you know, the code on for, for, for to analyze this is huge, and I, we have a lot of people who do this. But I'll be happy to give you more details. Um, I wanted to go back to, because we talked about uh, patents uh, yeah. with uh, Belgasm. What kind of patents do you hold? I have a few patents um, that actually have um, applications in dentistry, which has been... Um, commercialized and so forth. So today, when you go to the dentist and have that blue light, to, 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 if you have a cavity and they put some, some um, amalgam there, and then you have the blue light, that's what we've developed uh, at one point. Then there's a patent to, um, to detect bridges if bridges are about to fall. I was hearing the guy from the cast by yesterday, if you put a fiber in a laser, you can see these vibrations, and if you can see if something is about to fall, you have again an early sign that it might fall. And, and that's another patent. And there's patents also in medicine to detect things in medicine. 
uh, and especially in babies and things like that. I'll go back to cancer research. Yeah. Uh, how close are you to commercialize uh, the results Good. you guys have? Yeah. So how close are we to commercialize the results we have? Um, we, uh, there are a lot of companies that had approached us. There's a Dutch company, I'm not saying the name. There's the companies in, um, in the US also, New Jersey and California, and one in Minneapolis. What we want to do is just um, wait a little bit because I might want to do this by myself. So, and, and I can get the right. There's also a friend of mine who's sitting not far from here who introduced me to somebody else in California who's also interested in doing this. So at the moment, I want to get to 100% before we move to, uh, to, to, to something else. Now I'll ask a question. I'll take one last question, uh, Dr. Shikhun there. One last question uh, from me and one from the audience. Um, can you tell me more about life in Mars? How, how close am I to go to Mars? Okay. You hear people going, going you know, that they're, they're planning to go to Mars and people are getting training and so forth. Yes, maybe you can get there. The problem is, and the major problem is this, the radiation on Mars, the radiation, the cosmic radiation, the things that are coming from the sun, is huge. So if there is life on Mars, it's not going to be at the surface. It's going to be underneath, maybe three, four, five meters under the rocks. So whoever is going there, just watch out, because it is going to be like if you were taking an MRI all the time. Okay? So you get fried in less than a week. Uh, Dr. Chiron, you wanted to ask a question. C'est Bonjour, Smaël Chiron du Conseil d'affaires adjoint américain, mais surtout ancien Californien avec mes amis, surtout Belkacem. Je voulais juste un témoignage, parce qu'en ce moment, euh, Dr. Nordin Melekshi est, est, est le chairman d'une fondation algéro-américaine dédiée à la science et à la technologie, et principalement un groupe pour le cancer. Belkacem Habba est, est également membre de, de cette fondation. Et il y a également d'autres algéro-américains qui sont membres. Donc, ils ont eux-mêmes oublié de parler de ça, puisqu'on se réunit souvent euh, ouais. aux USA. Et tous les deux ont oublié hier de parler de cette fondation Merci. qui va travailler avec l'Algérie maintenant. Toute cette expertise de, de la diaspora algéro-américaine qui va travailler sur l'Algérie. Donc il y a tout un travail qui est en train de se faire. Et j'aimerais rajouter juste quelque chose hier. Abel Qasim Habba, je n'ai pas eu le temps de... Il n'est pas uniquement le seul champion dans la famille. Il se trouve qu'il a, j'espère qu'il ne va pas m'en vouloir, sa fille est champion d'athlétisme de l'État de Californie et des États-Unis junior. Et je finirai par dire, parce que hier, Shab Khaled est venu, et il n'a pas demandé d'argent, mais il faut savoir que c'est... Ouais, J'ai pas fini encore. Ces deux grands experts, on les paye pour assister à des conférences à l'étranger, et ils sont là aujourd'hui avec tout leur temps, donc c'est pour oui. ça que je vous demanderai de les remercier pour cela. Non, mais c'est pour ça que je voulais... Je, je, je vais... Je, vous... vous. Euh, Nordin est très accessible. Je vais vous dire comment je comment j'ai eu le contact de Nordin. J'ai simplement envoyé un message il y a deux ans sur LinkedIn et il m'a il m'a répondu cinq minutes plus tard me disant que je suis in in in. Et la même chose cette année, je l'ai appelé et il m'a dit qu'il allait venir. À I'll be there. I'll do my best. Son agenda était hyper blindé, mais il s'est il s'est. Thank you very much for being here. A very big applause to Nordin, our... Uh... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Et encore thank une you. fois, il est trop, très, très modeste, donc vous pouvez thank lui parler, lui demander des questions. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, Nordin. Merci.